Professor Farina, Professor Farina, welcome. Uh, welcome everybody. Today we will talk about the consulting program, uh, the Capstone, and um, with us today is Professor Farina, who has an extensive experience as a co corporate executive in many uh, leading companies such as Citigroup, JP Morgan Chase, and American Express. He is currently a distinguished lecturer and director of business consulting at Zicklin School of Business. Professor, welcome. Thank you. Thank you Delighted for joining us today. <clears throat> Happy to be here. So, Professor, today we will talk about the business consulting class, and um, later we'll, you will tell us a little more about exciting surprises uh, during this class coming up next year and uh, next semester <laughs> and year as well. Yeah, so... Um... <clears throat> Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm going to do two things today. I'm going to take you through an overview of the course, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. And then I will take you through a, uh, a case study on Grumbach, which is the project that we did jointly with the partnership school at the University of Bozen Balzano in Italy. And um, I'm hoping that we will do that again this uh, spring. Um, <clears throat> I don't know what company it will be, but um, my colleagues uh, at Bolzano are, are working on that. Um, Kadisha, you're going to you're going to manage the raising of hands, and if you see people want to ask a question, just stop me. Um, I'm sure I, they I are. It, they have a lot of questions to ask you. I leave it entirely up to you all. Absolutely. You, can, you can stop me in the middle or we can wait till the end. I, I don't care. Whatever works best for you. So um, let's start with the course. <clears throat> um, as Kadisha mentioned, I direct the uh, program and I also have another full time instructor, uh, Professor Arthur Chivas, who is a former partner at McKinsey. Um, he has been working with me for several years and he is a full time instructor. He was also an investment banker at J.P. Morgan. Um, the course emphasizes teamwork above everything else, um, solving client problems, which is why consultants are hired, um, and capturing client opportunities to help them perform better. Uh, and we also spend a lot of time talking about the importance of managing client relations. And in that connection, um, we typically bring in a professional consultant to talk to you about um, <clears throat> what they do and, and how they do it. Um, th this uh, past semester, we had um, we had someone come in and he gave an excellent presentation over uh, not only how they manage their relationships, but also how they look at the um, general market and size of wallet uh, for the industry in which they consult. We've put through more than a thousand students at this point. We're in year number seven, and we've done over a hundred projects across the business spectrum, as well as nonprofit organizations. We don't focus on any particular industry uh, or any particular uh, size of company. We we work with everybody as long as there's a reasonable business uh, concern, an ongoing business concern, as opposed to someone having an idea and writing it down on the back of an envelope. Professor, if you allow me to um, interrupt and ask you, so how do you choose these uh, concerns? I find them. <clears throat> so every semester I find clients and in the while the semester is going, mm -hmm. um, I continue to source possibilities. So it's an ongoing process for me. Mm -hmm. And once we, um, we've collected the, um, a good list, uh, we sit down and we vet each client and make sure that what they're submitting is a viable project for our students as well as for them. So, so mm -hmm. for example, we have um, next semester, we're going to work again with MasterCard. This is a cybersecurity project. 
Um, we're also going to work with the New York City CEO Jobs Council uh, directly for the council. We are likely to repeat working with um, Hospital for Special Surgery and Citigroup. Uh, and then we have uh, smaller companies referred to us by the Field Center for Entrepreneurship. Uh, and, um, and we've had a number of minority and women-owned businesses, which is a state-designated um, uh, category that allows you for uh, to access certain uh, benefits in uh, developing your business in New York State. Uh, I just think it's something that we ought to do as a member of the of the Baruch community at large. So um, we have a mix of nonprofits, startups, midsize, and big companies. <clears throat> the teams are formed uh, out of the cohort, um, typically four to six people per team. Uh, we've learned from experience that less than four is a very bad idea because typically the work falls to one person. Um, more than six people, and it gets unwieldy. So mm -hmm. we think four to five, maybe six is the right number. Um, you will select the leader on the first day of class, and then we assign an advisor. And a number of these advisors have been working with me over the years. Some of them are uh, professional management consultants. Uh, others are uh, executives in other fields of endeavor. And we have a couple of faculty members. Outside of the of the companies they will be working with, they will have professional advisors who will guide them throughout the project. Yes. So a typical consulting firm, um, when they put together a team for a client to work on a project, they usually have a senior uh, involved in the management of the work or at least overseeing the project. Uh, McKinsey calls those engagement directors. Um, and... The reason for that is is twofold. Number one, partners at McKinsey charge too much money. <laughs> and so if the partners themselves were to do the work, that it, they would blow the budget. Um, and secondly, um, the, um, uh, the, the, the role it, that our advisors play is a counselor um, to the team. So if you've got a problem or you're not quite sure what to do or where to go, you have the advisor to fall back on and you can uh, talk to the advisor uh, about different aspects of the project. And we try to match the advisor's background with the uh, the client's industry um, as best we can. Mm -hmm. We have a couple of folks who are former bankers, so uh, they're, they've are they got a pretty broad background. Mm -hmm. Good questions. Um here I have two other questions. Mm -hmm. uh, one from Jameen asking, do students have the opportunity to choose which clients they get paired with? What they do. So what we, we do is we, we ask for a summary of the problem mm -hmm. from every client. So we say to them, tell us what your business is. Describe the competitive landscape in which you operate and your competitive advantage, and then tell us what the problem that you want our students to solve. So we collect all those. And Justin Makarevich, who's from the Graduate Career Services Center, works very closely with me. And he sends those out to everybody. And you, we ask you to pick your top three. Now, we don't promise that you're going to get one of those, but we do our best to match you up. And the reason for that is we have to ensure that every project is staffed. So yeah. with the enrollment, as I see it for the spring, will be around 110 students. So that's 20 projects at least, including um, a, a joint project with Bolzano if we go through with that. So that's a lot of projects. Oh, so the project in Italy is is one of the projects. It's not separate. It's not an additional one. It's one of the main projects, right? Well, I look at it as one of the main projects because I have to assign all of you to a project. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, and so before getting to this, we have another question from Nathan. Do we get to choose our own team members? No. 
Okay. Um, sometimes students want to work with someone that they know, and and so they want to swap with another with another team. That's fine with me, but that's up to you to manage. Um, if you can get someone to switch, that's fine, but I don't get involved in that. Okay. Um, Fadia is asking, will the perf uh, will the project in Italy be offered in the summer? No, uh, and that's not a good time to go there <laughs> for two reasons. The tourists overrun it and it gets hot. So uh, we're going to do it in the spring uh, because that's when the university offers its consulting course. And their schedule is a little different from ours. So they begin later and finish later. So we manage the, the timeline um, to uh, coincide with what we need to get done here in time for final grades. Uh, but uh, we, we do have to manage the scheduling because it isn't uh, 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 very congruent, but it's good enough. Okay. Uh, we have another question from Jamie asking, is it typical for students to take this capstone course with other courses to be full-time? Uh, no, uh, most of our students are part-time. They're evening yeah. students. I know. mean, according to Jamie, there are rumors circulating to take the, the course by itself alone without- oh I, oh, I strongly recommend that. But when, but most most of the time, uh, people don't take that advice. And they, they sign up for six other credits besides this one. And uh, and then they give themselves a very challenging semester. I really don't recommend that. And I understand that people are, are you know ready to get 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 this over with and get out and you know move on with their lives. But if you want to get a lot out of this course, um, you really should should have the time that it takes. And it isn't hard, but it it is a uh, it is work. And it's uh, it's a lot of work, but then we we staff um, the team sufficiently so that no one person is burdened unfairly with the amount of work that has to be done for the client. These yeah. are excellent questions, by the way. <laughs> Hi, am I able to answer, ask a question? Um, I wanted to. I think I missed the part about the clients in Italy. The Italy opportunity is it. Um, client relationships in Italy? And if so, um, what are the kind of the different types of clients you may have there? And if there are also any other international um, countries where this can be, um, this capstone can be done? That's another great question. Um, the way it works is we rely on the University of Bolzano Bolzano to identify the client and the project. And then we we put together a team of Baruch students and Bolzano students, and they work together as one team. And uh, last year was the first year that we did this in person. We did it remotely be when COVID was uh, with us, but last year travel restrictions were lifted. And, um, and so we got funding to send a team of students to Italy for a week along with a professor, uh, Professor Prosak, who's now with the Boston Consultant Group. And they were uh, hosted by the school as well as the client. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you what the project was after we get through this phase. <clears throat> and then uh, they worked remotely during the semester. And then the students from Bolzano came to New York for a week and we uh, hosted them. Um, we had a reception, we also, uh, had it prepared a number of lectures, <clears throat> and then they made the final presentation in New York um, to the CEO of the business, who at the time was in Italy. So it was a Zoom call um, at around, I think, nine o'clock in the morning, because Europe is six hours ahead. And so, you know, we wanted to do this when, um, you know, it made sense on both sides of the uh, of the pond, so to speak. Thank you. And I just have one follow-up question um, mm -hmm. about clients. Uh, mm -hmm. How many, can you name any different type of real estate clients that you may, that Brooke may work with? Uh, yes. Re real New York is a client we've worked with off and on for a couple of years. 
And I had a conversation with someone uh, either yesterday or the day before from Houlihan Lawrence. And I don't think that's going to happen until the fall. Mm -hmm. And to um, answer your, your other question, uh, I am very open to uh, sending students abroad where we can do it. So it doesn't have to be necessarily with the University of Bolzano. We do that because they're a partnership school, but we have partnership schools in China. Um, uh, we have one in France. Uh, and I understand we may have one or two in Brazil. Um, it's a matter of logistics and funding. Mm -hmm. uh, but I've spent a lot of time overseas. I lived abroad. I was based in Singapore for American Express. And my uh, territory was the Pacific Rim from Tokyo to Australia. Uh, and when I re repatriated to New York, I had jobs that brought me uh, to Latin America, Mexico, as well as most of Europe. So I, I think the ability to travel and see what it's like on the other in other countries is extremely valuable, not only for you personally, but also professionally. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. So um, our goals for you uh, are to prepare you for the real world through real world consulting projects. I mean, these are projects that are uh, value add for the client. Uh, these are not things that organizations dream up because they want to be good citizens, but these are real, um, real problems. Um, I can I can tell you more about that in a bit. The other goal is to showcase your talent. Um, we attract students from everywhere. We are probably the most diverse school on the planet. Uh, and if we're not, we're pretty close. And I think that that's fabulous um, because the um, outcome is we have a group of people who come to a problem, approach a problem from different points of view, and you get the best thinking from people as a team. And that's very, very powerful. And yes, we have had our students um, receive job offers. That's sort of the idea. I've talked about the international experience. Um, and it's also a way to expand your networking uh, opportunities. Once you meet each other, you meet the client, um, you're doing research, you may run into people um, that you want to remain in touch with. Um, it's, a, it's a way to build a network if you don't have one or to expand it if you do have one. So what are our goals for the program? Um, we want to do all these things. Um, I'm always looking for clients, and I gladly accept referrals from students. We have attracted some ex experts to participate as guest speakers and adjunct faculty. I hope we can do more of that. Uh, the course is likely to reinforce um, everything you've learned up to now, or at least we hope so. Uh, that's why it's called a capstone, and um, and we we do touch on a lot of things that that you will have had. You you'll certainly um, encounter finance issues, operations, marketing, um, talent, people problems, people challenges, um, staffing issues. Uh, so we're we're. Um, we're, we're confident that, <clears throat> excuse me, that with each semester, uh, students usually get to apply a lot of what they've learned. Um, we we now offer a course <clears throat> to undergraduates similar. It's not at the same level because your graduate students, many of you have seven to eight business uh, years of experience. Hmm. But what we do for the um, operations majors who are required to take a consulting course is we use cases. So I mentioned this because this is all about experiential learning and you're gonna hear more about it because it's an integral part of the President Wu's strategic plan. And um, I was appointed by the provost 
to a search committee that's looking for a college-wide director uh, for this position, as well as <clears throat> um, we um, we're a, a, there's also a working group of which I'm a part that will, on an ongoing basis, work with this new director um, and help guide the initiative across the college. So, you know, there's a lot in the um, in the in the media. Excuse me. <laughs> There's a lot in the media about, you know, is is the expense worth it for the degree? And, you know, should we just blow up the liberal arts curriculum and, you know, who needs it and so on and so forth. And my response to that is learning is lifelong. Learning is lifelong. There is a lot to be gotten out of understanding the humanities, reading history, understanding economics politics, international relations, and so forth. Um, and you need to keep your skill set up to date uh, in, in a changing world like this. And so I expect that we'll see um, we'll see a response to these kinds of things uh, going forward. Uh, so, but it's just something for you to think about. Yeah. Uh, so just sorry to interrupt you. No, no, but since you mentioned that there is an equivalent to um, to undergrads, we have a question here from an MS student who is asking if there is an equivalent for them. No, there isn't. And are there any potential possibility <laughs> of having something similar for them? Uh, that is something that um, I'd be happy to discuss offline. Uh, I really can't give you a good answer to that. There, um, there are a set of um, prerequisites that MBA students have to complete in order to take the course. Mm -hmm. So if, um, if MS students would like to take it, this course, then it would have to be evaluated as, with respect to what, um, what, what have they taken course-wise. Mm -hmm. uh, and it will also require the approval of the academic heads of each MS program. So it's so, going to be case to case. Uh, yeah, I mean, equation. my um, my my personal view is if you're going, if you're interested in consulting, um, and you're an MS student, it would probably make sense if you could take a course like this or this one. It's just not up to me to make that decision. Um, and we do have, in fact, I know of a young fellow who I believe was an MS uh, in finance graduate who's a Build Fellow at McKinsey. Um, so our, you know, our MS graduates do go on to say the big four, uh, which have huge consulting arms. Um, and at some point you may decide that, you know, getting into the profession is something you want to do. Uh, but as I say, that's, that's probably best handled offline. So, um, in the classroom, what we do is we show you examples of what consulting is. Um, and you think about it this way, when a client calls a consultant in to solve a problem, it's for a couple of reasons. One of them is they may not have the expertise that they need. They may know what needs to be done, but don't have the staff or they think they know what needs to be done and they're looking for validation. Uh, and many students have heard of consultants, but very few of them really know what the actual work looks like. And so that's what we give you in the classroom. And you'll see this when I take you through the Grunbach presentation. So this is a breakdown of the fall and spring semester. We offer it in the summer, but it's only 10 weeks. And so it's very intense. And the projects that you get um, ne by necessity must be scoped downward so that it fits within a 10-week time frame. Uh, the way it, it will work in the spring and the way it's working this semester is the um, first four weeks is the, you get organized as a team, you'll select the leader, <clears throat> you'll meet the client, you'll meet your advisor, and then once you met the client, you will write a letter of proposal. 
And that's very, very important because that spells out what it is you're going to do. Uh, and once the client is, is um, pleased that it explains accurately what they want done, uh, both the students and the, the client sign it. Uh, sometimes we are asked to sign an NDA, that's non-disclosure agreement, and we do that routinely. And I think you can understand you're going to be given very uh, proprietary information, sometimes very sensitive financial or competitive in information, and we have to ensure that it stays confidential. Uh, by week five, you're ready to launch, and you spend the next five weeks uh, doing the analysis and the problem solving. And that includes research. And we, um, we give you some background on the resources that are available in the Newman Library, which are extensive. And we encourage you to take advantage of it. At um, the end of week 10 is when you will make your first formal presentation. And that's a progress review with the client. But before you do that, you present your uh, report in class. And typically we have a panel of professors who evaluate your, your uh, presentation and we give you feedback on it. And then uh, after that, you present to the client. The back end of the semester is as it says here, uh, you're formulating your conclusions, you are developing the recommendations uh, and spelling out next steps. And I want to emphasize this very uh, emphatically. What you're doing is um, recommending actionable steps to be taken to solve a problem. So this is not something that's theoretical. Um, but in fact, it says, you know, you asked us to develop a go-to-market plan for you. So we've done that. And here are the things that you need to do. Step one step two, and so on and so forth. And it is also a, um, a good opportunity for you to ask the client if they want to continue working with Baruch in uh, successive semesters. And we have a number of repeat clients. And, and the reason for that is you may discover while you're um, doing your engagement that what they need to do is going to take longer than one semester. And we have worked with uh, clients um, over several semesters. Uh, so um, it, it, I like it because it helps me um, find projects for the students, um, but it's also a way of building a longer term relationship. So for example, we've been working with Citigroup now for seven years. Um, we've been working with Stop Abuse Campaign uh, for at least two or three. Well, where we go for here is more. <laughs> um, build new partnerships, expand on existing ones, continue to work with um, local businesses. And as I said earlier in the presentation, referrals are always welcome. So uh, I think I've talked about the uh, the project at Bolzano, and, and we're going to spend we can spend more time on this when I take you through the the presentation. Here is a list of clients that we've worked with, and you can see a number of them are uh, household names, and some of them may not be well known, but. Um, Others Trade for Hope is an example. We've been working with them for well over a year. The United Nations Capital Development Fund, uh, this is the third semester that we're working with them. Um, uh, we've done a couple of projects for the School of Optometry, our cousins at the State University. Hospital for Special Surgery, uh, you've probably heard of. Uh, and then there's a lineup on the uh, far right we are working with Lighthouse Guild this semester. In fact, in the spring, we'll do two projects for them. They are a nonprofit that works with the visually impaired. Uh, and there is some amazing technology that's coming out that uh, helps people with um, who are visually impaired. And our students have been helping uh, flesh this out. 
Uh, Cru de Fromage is a catering business that was started by a woman from New Orleans. And the project this semester is um, uh, it, it giving her um, a, uh, a plan on how to expand her business. She's basically a one woman show. And if she wants to build scale, she's going to need to add people. And our challenge is um, <clears throat> given financial projections, what should she do? How should she do it? And so on and so forth. Um, similar to what we did for Montclair Brewery, which is a micro owned brewer uh, in New Jersey. And the lady who owns it along with her husband is a Baruch uh, alum. And that, that was, uh, that's been fun. So I'll stop there. Um, let me now open up Grunbach. Professor? Yep. Uh, let me see if I can get back in here and do this. Where are we? Um, all right. So, Grumbach. So, this was a... Um, this, this project had two uh, facets to it. Uh, a little bit of background, uh, Grunbach is a family owned manufacturing company based in Bavaria. And the client um, that we worked with last, uh, last spring is an Italian subsidiary located uh, in Bolzano. What they do is um, they make, and they're really good at it, is they make hinges for high-end appliances. So they do a lot of um, manufacturing for companies that make refrigerators, companies that make ovens, um, companies that make uh, microwaves. And there is a significant opportunity for them to enter the United States market. So the first thing was um, validate where they ought to locate their marketing hub. That was uh, one, one angle of the project, and that was Chicago. And you'll see from um, a map I'm going to show you in a bit why that was. Um, and the second one is um, they are starting to acquire market share and since they manufacture most of these products in Italy, um, at some point, that really is not sustainable. And they're going to have to figure out um, how to improve delivery. And one possibility is simply to build an assembly plant here in the United States. And I'll take you through what, what was decided. So. They laid out where they are now, right? Phase one, they have a sales representative who was on the project, by the way. He's a student at the University of Bolzano. Um, and I think he's finished his degree and he's now over here full time. Um, we start the first- For the survey. same company? Yes. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, uh, and then they start the serial production for the U.S. customers. So- that's that's where that's where they were um, uh, about a year ago. So the recommendation uh, from the team was <clears throat> locate in the Chicago or Midwest United States for business development. That's where many of their competitors are. Focus on on hero products, which are <laughs> basically what you're really good at making, and they make great fasteners. Now, I know this is not terribly exciting, but you have to think about the engineering that goes into these things because the sizes of the appliances that are sold in the United States differ 
from the sizes of the appliances that are sold in overseas countries. Um, and I, I see some folks shaking their heads. I can tell you, having lived abroad, um, dishwashers are not the same size. Um, sockets and plugs. You know, when I used when I traveled, I had one of those converters. So I'd go anywhere in the world and I would be able to have, uh, you know, I'd be able to use appliances. Uh, cars are not as big in Europe uh, or in India, for example, because the streets aren't as wide as they are in the United States. So this is something that needs to be thought about. And they are very high tech. So the, the factory that the students visited was very, very impressive. And if you go on LinkedIn uh, and you Google this, you should be able to see a film uh, that the uh, folks at Balzano put together uh, showing the students who met uh, at the factory uh, while they were over there. So the focus is on high manufacturing, high quality manufacturing, um, and to focus on long-term growth um, in the oven industry besides some short-term challenges. The other thing you need to think about when you're a, uh, I'm going to say foreign simply because it's easier, uh, but when you're a foreign operator in a uh, in an overseas market, you have to look at legality, you have to look at tax, you have to look at risk, um, and you know these are very important to determine an optimal management decision. <clears throat> Another thing they thought of was to use export as a service to ship directly to customers. So if you're a manufacturer, let's say that you're a, a Miele in the United States and you manufacture Miele products in the United States, the idea here is that they just ship directly to you. But that's going to require you to hold the inventory, whether you need it or not. Um, but that is one thing to consider as opposed to shipping it to the United States, putting in a warehouse where, where you have to store it, you have to pay rent on that warehouse. And then you have to hope that that product moves. So um, they um, they thought of uh, export as a service. And here we get into shipping terminology, and that's the container. Um, shipping on a full container load um, is far more cost effective for export processes. Um, and it minimizes um, quantities uh, having to be shipped while considering the need for safety storage. And it also will allow you to build market share um, with the uh, intent of becoming a local manufacturer. Yeah. So here are, um, this is the roadmap for the kinematics division. The first thing they did was a uh, market analysis. Uh, and you, you can read these points here. I'm not going to go through every one of these bullets. Um, then to look at subsidiary and international considerations, I've, I've touched on freight, imports, exports, and so forth, um, and, as well as alternatives for setting up a subsidiary. And having worked for Citigroup, I can tell you that um, legal entities are very complicated, and they exist for a whole host of reasons. In financial services, a lot of it is for tax, but in a manufacturing operation, it can be different. And then the next um, uh, area was exporting warehousing and shipping services. And then lastly, uh, financial uh, analysis and market share. And, and you can see what the, the team produced at the bottom of each uh, block where it says output, yeah. All right, now here's the map. And uh, apologies for those blocks, but essentially you can see um, the concentration of customers and competitors is pretty much in Chicago, although you've got some um, down here in Mississippi, you have some in the South, you have uh, a couple in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, but the preponderance is, um, is the Midwest. And here you see to the right, the Sub-Zero Group. Uh, is in uh, for sure in Chicago and a little further outside Whirlpool manufacturers in Pennsylvania and Kenmore, uh, which is an old Sears product, is down in Florida.
So the um, the findings on uh, on competitor analysis was that Grumbach didn't have much competition in the United States. Uh, many companies that manufacture something similar are located in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. uh, the bulk of their customers, Grumbach's customers, are within driving distance of Chicago. And the convenience of this proximity was probably the most substantial factor for recommending that Chicago be the hub for the marketing uh, office. And then these charts, and again, I'm, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. If you're interested in this deck, I'm, I'd be happy to send it to you. Um, but the but the charts are basically saying um, CAGR 5% by 33, uh, and that's 17 billion euros, which is around 16 billion and change US dollars. Uh, there's a specific demand for smart ovens. Um, and I'm told smart ovens, um, they do a lot of things, but one of the things that they do is... Um, they were thinking of doing is you you sort of wave your foot under the oven and the door automatically opens up. Um, that's something you might or might not want to do depending on whether you have a pet because um, you certainly wouldn't want the kitty going into the oven by mistake. Um, but there are some amazing things that they can do. And uh, the commercial um, oven, commercial oven market size, right? Mm -hmm. um, expected to grow uh, 11 billion uh, this year and surpass 22 billion euros by uh, 1033, which is not all that far out. And you can see the uh, smart oven market is look, looking uh, to uh, reach almost uh, 500 million euros in three years. So this is all very good information and it's very positive, right? So if you're looking at this market, um, keep looking. So uh, we also talked about the market trends um, for the refrigerator market. <clears throat> uh, the key players, you've heard of all these, I'm sure. I don't know higher. Um, I haven't heard of them, but I know Whirlpool, LG. Um, I'll, I happen to have Electrolux appliances in my home on Long Island. I, I always thought of them as an outfit that made vacuum cleaners, but they make very good uh, washer dryers and refrigerators. And, and then this chart gets into the pluses and minuses of shipping, right? Air freight um, is very expensive. <clears throat> it may be the fastest way to get something overseas, but it is very expensive. Uh, and weight, as you can appreciate in an aircraft, um, is a major consideration. Mm -hmm. I don't know if any of you saw on the news, but apparently a... Um, a cargo plane was transporting um, horses in their hold uh, on its way to Belgium, and one of the horses came out of the stall. And the um, the captain radioed Boston and said, "We've got to return." So they ended up dumping twenty tons of fuel in the Atlantic Ocean, so that they could return to Kennedy Airport uh, and re check the check the horse. They had a vet waiting, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, this is a live animal, right? This is not hinges. And so they were able to take care of the problem and then turn around and fly again. And they eventually got to Brussels where they were intending to go. I bring this up just to show you that sometimes the unexpected happens. And, you know, that, that means delays. That can mean more costs. And then we get into the alternatives for shipping, uh, a less than full container or less than full load. Uh, and then the full load. Uh, and you can read the pluses and minuses as well as the conclusions here uh, probably faster than I can say them. Uh, legal considerations. So you have re regulatory standards and procedures. And you can th this is um, intended to uh, portray a cycle, which is what it is. Uh, so you've got... Um, Things to consider is do you invoice through a subsidiary in the United States or do you invoice them directly from Europe? And if you do, you know, are there tax considerations? Uh, are there incentives and hurdles uh, um, in terms of paying back the foreign, uh, foreign companies? And then you have um, risks as currency exchange risk. If you, uh, 
if your costs are all in euros, um, you're not going to bill an American client in euros. You're going to build them, build them in dollars, build them in dollars, right? So there is an element of FX risk. And then, of course, there's shipment um, and default. You know, somebody doesn't pay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, here are some uh, key considerations for expert export as a service. And I mentioned earlier on that the customer is expected to keep at least one month of material in stock. Um, although the customer is, is virtually liability free, um, there, there is not any risk to the client where they take to take one month of material uh, directly. Uh, packaging optimization is an, another um, consideration because it decreases markup. Um, and then we get into direct transportation, which is called um, last mile uh, transport. And that is once you get the product to the hub in the United States, you have a number of companies that then take you to the final mile. Um, so if you think about it, you were to go over to New Jersey or to Brooklyn, and watch these cargo ships unload, once all that stuff is on the pier, right, it's got to move. And so the question is, how do we get this stuff off the pier to the customer? And, and so you got to, you got to take that into consideration. And so uh, they've got, um, again, what they call last mile uh, delivery. Um, here are some key numbers, which I'm not going to go into here. I, I really couldn't do a very good job of explaining them, but I'm showing you this because it, it um, demonstrates the detail uh, that the students went into in coming up with their recommendations. <clears throat> and they, um, they uh, did some uh, scenarios to uh, North Carolina, as well as delivery to Monterey, Mexico, as possible hubs for distribution. Uh, and this is a saw chart that uh, there is a mathematical formula that they worked out. In essence, it says, when do we ship? Uh, uh, how often, how much? And they have to think about that too. The market share analysis just reconfirms what I mentioned to you earlier about uh, the compound and annual growth rate looking very good for the next several years. And then the recommendation timeline, there were short-term, medium, and long-term uh, that um, were recommended to the, the client. And as far as I know, they are in the implementation stages of this recommendation. They may consider a joint venture um, regarding existing warehouse quotes versus the creation of a U.S. plant. Uh, I've had some um, indirect experience with joint ventures, and, and they don't always work out. On paper, they look great, uh, but, but when you put things together, sometimes they don't. I've been through three major corporate mergers, and uh, only one was a real success. And another one is still recovering from something that happened 20 years ago. Are we there? Have, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Kadisha. Are there um, any kind of unexpected problems that arise, or is it mainly um, a lack of? Not a. I mean, yeah. Is it unexpected or unplanned problem? Unplanned problem that arise. Both. In this case, both. both. If if we want to talk about mergers and acquisitions, I can tell you most of the time the reason they fail is culture, culture and egos, resistance to change, and and uh, culture is is incredibly important. Uh, the, the father of modern management is a guy named Peter Drucker, and he's wrote volumes on uh, the practice of management, and he said culture eats strategy for lunch every day. And and he's right. So if you have a partner, you have to have trust. You have to you have to trust the person uh, or company. You have to feel that they completely understand what you're doing, how you're trying to do it. 
they buy into your business proposition. You buy in to the way they do business. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, it says joint. So 50-50 seems, you know, you want controlling interest. Why would I want to go into a JV if I don't have at least equal, if not more interest? You know, those things get, they get ironed out in negotiations, but they, they can be tricky. And then consultants, um, unless you're a tax attorney or a CPA or a certified financial analyst, you do not provide uh, tax advice. And even if you are a CFA, you shouldn't pr provide tax advice. But you get my point is that is not what consultants do. Uh, you leave that to the specialists. Mm -hmm. um, economies of scale are very important because when you negotiate contracts, um, you can have a very good outcome if, if you consider how much you can do, how much more you can do with what you got. Um, and then also they told them to build out their differentiation strategy um, in a, um, you know, in this segment of the market. So, uh, uh, Professor, I have a question regarding your, uh, uh, you mentioning that culture is a recurring issue, why m &A fails. Um, is, is culture like um, a dominant sort of cause of failure in acquisitions as well? I can understand like when it comes to a merger, both the companies have an equal or a predetermined say uh, as to what will happen post the merger. But in an acquisition, wouldn't the acquirer have the final say and eventually implement their own culture? Oh, for sure. No, I, I'm talking about when um, I'm talking about when American Express bought Shearson Low Roads uh, in the 1980s. I'm talking about when Travelers Insurance bought Citicorp. In 1998, I was there. Uh, I was there through the whole thing. Right. Uh, I'm talking about when uh, Chase Manhattan bought J.P. Morgan, uh, as opposed to when Chase, uh, when Chemical Bank and Manufacturers Hanover merged. So you're absolutely right. I mean, when you're the acquirer, you're holding all the cards. Uh, and so, what's the what's the uh, the point of the story? The point of the story is that my personal experience is there is no such thing as a merger of equals. Right. Somebody loses and somebody wins. And uh, the egos of CEOs is, <laughs> well, you can, you, you can judge for yourself. Those people don't like stepping aside uh, so that someone else can come in and take over. And, and if you're interested, very, very uh, fascinating article in yesterday's New York Times, a feature story on David Zasloff, uh, who was the CEO of uh, Discovery Channel. They bought uh, Time Warner uh, uh, from AT&T, and thus far it has been a disaster. And the stock price is uh, depreciated by 50% under this guy's watch, uh, and it is not a happy story. Oh. So, um, excellent question, uh, Ramesh. Thank you. Uh, Professor, we have two other questions. Mm -hmm. One is about the students that are currently on the waiting list. Waiting yes. list. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't, I don't manage enrollment, but we are looking at opening a second section in the evening. Oh, okay. And I, I think that decision will be made by uh, executive program sometime soon. Okay. Uh, it appears as though we have, uh, well, yesterday the numbers I heard were 14, 15. Mm -hmm. uh, I teach the afternoon section and there are some students who signed up for that but would likely move to the evening section. So if that is the case, uh, you got 15, which is the number that I believe the dean says they want to run another section, uh, it it could look it's looking like it could happen, uh, but executive programs has to say on that, and so you really need to contact um, Professor uh, Corn or Beth Virginia. Okay, thank you. And um, how long is the course in the summer? The course won't be given in the summer, right, Professor? No, we have to offer it because students want it. Okay. So it's 10 weeks. 
10 weeks. Okay. And yeah. another question about um, the Grumbach project. I wonder if the team explored Grumbach having a brick and mortar. mortar. Uh, no. Well, yes and no. What they did, and it, it doesn't show up on here, <clears throat> is they identified a number of locations, possible locations, uh, in the South where they could build a distribution facility or, or, and an assembly, and an assembly facility. Okay. So why? <laughs> uh, several reasons. Number one, uh, they have a lot of deep water ports down there. Uh, uh, not Savannah, but um, Charleston mm -hmm. uh, is a deep water port. Um, it is a, uh, I would say, more management friendly in terms of labor relations. Uh, if you think about it over the years, Boeing uh, has, has put its 787 plant in uh, South Carolina, North Carolina, South Carolina, I believe. Uh, BMW uh, builds down there, a number of other manufacturers. <clears throat> so it, it cost-wise, it might be more attractive to put them down there, but um, I think that's still uh, TBD. Okay. I, I saw a question that said, you know, is it better to take the class in the summer or or in the fall, spring? Um, I think it's better to take it in the fall or the spring. You're not as rushed. You um, you have more time. You have 17 weeks versus, well, really 14 uh, versus 10. Um, it, I just think it, it, you can pace yourself better, but in the end, it's the student's decision as to what they wish to do. Mm -hmm. I also have one more question, Professor. Um, yeah. So you, uh, so I can understand like the framework for a company, like for us, for the project, there can be a framework for Cronback in terms of, because it's a logistical company. So we can have a market share analysis. We can have a risk assessment, but yeah. you mentioned there could be a project like the stop abuse project for city. Would the framework be seen or would it differ based on the nature of the project and the nature of the industry itself that is assigned? Yeah, that's excellent. That's an excellent question. Uh, we teach you what they what is called the pyramid principle. Mm -hmm. uh, we also teach you um, uh, a technique called MISI. Now, those are McKinsey terms. And the book we use was written by a former McKinsey consultant. And I'll let you in on a secret. Uh, besides Professor Chivas, uh, Professor Nora Gold also worked for McKinsey. Uh, she was on the support side and um, she does an outstanding job on presentations. So what we do is we teach you how to analyze the problem. Right. Uh, and there are a lot of similarities in terms of what is the problem, uh, breaking it down into its components, what are the key drivers, making sure that you've got a complete list. When they say MISI, it means um, mutually in, uh, exclusive uh, and comp comprehensively exhaustive, mm -hmm. which means you've thought of everything <laughs> and you've put everything in the right boxes so that you're not, you know, you're not fudging uh, a main driver with a subsidiary driver or um, a, a uh, an issue that, that is confined strictly, say, to marketing. Um, uh, so the technique is similar, but clearly your recommendations and the outcome, that's going to vary. Um, and, and here again, what we encourage you to do is become an expert in that industry. And even if you're working for a privately held firm, there is still public information that you can get at um, to learn about what uh, what's that industry is all about. And the way you do that is through the in information resources at the Newman Library. Um, Dr. Peggy Teich, uh, she's a, um, and uh, I think Dr. Ryan Phillips, both of them are excellent uh, in so far as guiding students on the research. And in consulting, and, and this is exactly what uh, one of our alums told me about McKinsey, <clears throat> he was 
His second assignment was to work in a for a healthcare company. <clears throat> Naturally, he couldn't tell me who it was, and I didn't ask him because I know he couldn't tell me. Furthermore, I, it's none of my business. I'm not interested in who it was. But he said to me, he said, you know, I'll tell you this. He said, I sure learned a lot about healthcare very fast. <clears throat> and I said, well, what are you doing now? He says, well, now I'm working uh, for a company that um, that manufactures electric uh, automobile chargers. Right. And of course, he couldn't give me that name either, nor, nor would I ask him to do so. So, you know, what I'm telling you is exactly what goes on in the real world. And I I did it. I mean, I, when I was a, an associate uh, consultant many years ago, I would be put on projects I knew nothing about. Um, and, you know, I, I worked on a, an assignment for General Electric uh, on inclusion and diversity. So the first thing I did was I, I went to the information center. I got the General Electric file and I looked at everything the company had done for GE in the history of the relationship. Uh, I did something similar when I was put on a project for the Federal Reserve System, where we worked for the Board of Governors. Um, and uh, another time I did a project for a manufacturer of, of um, it, uh, tools. It was Black & Decker, which I think is now owned by Stanley Tool Works. And we did quite a bit of work for Black & Decker, and that was uh, on climate assessment of the em employees. And, and so I didn't know anything about tool manufacturing other than that I've been in factories, I've worked in them, and I had a general idea how it worked. But it requires you to come up to speed and become an expert right away. And some people like it, some people don't. Uh, but we tell you to do this so that when you go in to visit your client, meet them for the very first time, you're prepared. And assuming you only have an hour of their time, um, you need to make sure that you've got all your questions buttoned up. Uh, you know what you want to get out of that meeting long before you walk into it. Uh, and you make sure you orchestrate the roles that different people are going to play in that interview. All right. And, and my hope is you have a little fun in the process because I, I, it, it can be really neat, I must tell you. <laughs> Especially when the chairman of the Atlanta Fed offers you his plumbing. <laughs> right does do the clients also sort um like will they tell you because i've worked as a banker and i've handled a portfolio of clients from different industries sometimes i've experienced that clients also dictate what kind of information can go out in the market and what cannot um maybe there is a project for which they want nothing to go out maybe there's a project that which they want everything to go up so will us as sort of students um um use the information that we're getting from the clients to sort of um discuss with you or discuss with anybody else or we should ask the clients or let the clients tell us how to handle the information that we're getting from them oh well the non-disclosure agreement spells out what what you can can't can't share right. uh, and and sometimes i sign them uh, sometimes professor chivas signs them the advisors uh, may sign them in which case you can talk to us very openly uh, about what um, what the issue is. Uh, also, we we lay out some parameters in class so that while we you know I'm telling you that you have to present your midterm report, um, you can give a report very very nicely without getting into a lot of confidential uh, details. So, so sure. excellent again, excellent question. Uh, we we're very careful uh, with that, and that's that's another reason we use uh, what uh, edge sourced which is an external platform that's been vetted by uh, IT at the university level. Uh, it is an ironclad system, the depository of uh, all the materials, including client files. So if you work for, let's say city asks us to do another project, you, you'll have access to the city file and you'll be able to go in there and look at what's been done. Uh, and the, you know we, we can do that because it's, the, it's very secure and it's very tight. But in order for you to have a good experience uh, to learn and for the client to be happy with your product, you, you, you've got to have some wiggle room there and yeah. you have to be able to talk to people because you, you're not expected to know everything. Thank you. If you're a banker, you're probably good at, at making people believe you know everything, but. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 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 well, 
I can tell. I bet. I bet you're pretty good at it. <laughs> I, I just to convince. I just have to convince the client that they're the best that exists in the business. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, Professor, one last question about, uh, so I see that uh, some of the students here is a little bit resistant. Um, and the question is, I'm taking my last functional class in the spring. Would, it, would I be able to take the capstone class at the same time? Uh, most likely. Uh, people would ask. Um, so I get asked that question. Professor Chivas gets asked the question. And, and normally we, we let people in. I get it. So normally it's not it's not possible. Well, what they want is they want you to, they want you to complete 18 credits. Yeah. Before you take this class. But if you've got 17 under your belt and you have a compelling reason to take um the last prereq along with this course, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes they'll let the instructor make that determination and usually we say yes. Okay. That's so a case by case basis. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Professor? Do, uh, do students work on cases and restructuring MA and turnaround? Uh, well, actually, we did do a turnaround, uh, the Astron case. And that's the first one that you'll see in class. That was a turnaround. So, uh, and we also have done reorgs. Um, m &A, no, um, we almost did, but we could not get the client to bite. <clears throat> I would love to do that. I, I know you guys could handle it. I mean, uh, <clears throat> and that was earlier on, we worked for a PE firm uh, and they were looking to buy um, a couple of companies in Europe. Um, and so what we did was we put together an analysis of the um, regulation uh, and, well, that wasn't so much the social, but it was the uh, legal and regulatory environment in Western Europe. And it was a spreadsheet that looked, you know, like this, uh, huge. And the reason for that is there are some general rules in the EU about what you can and can't do. This happened, this pertained to a company. Um, this was um, biotech, um, biohealth, uh, having to do with transportation of blood. And so you've got the overarching European rules, but then you have individual country rules. And I was hoping that that was going to lead in, uh, to more work because I think you guys would do a fabulous job identifying targets uh, and looking at the pluses and minuses of, you know, why a deal would make sense or why it wouldn't. And maybe we'll get one. Who knows? Hopefully. <laughs> Someone mentioned what is the, is, did I see that right? What's the success rate? Yes. A hundred percent. Uh, it, nobody's failed it yet. I know I, one part, one student I had, he tried his damnedest to fail, but I wouldn't let him, uh, <clears throat> no, it, it, it's a hundred percent, almost a hundred percent. Uh, we have, we had one or two people drop out and then come back and take the class another semester, but people complete it successfully. And, and, um, I see, uh, Jamie, you're, uh, I believe that's an air force uniform that you're wearing in your, your picture. Um, I don't need to tell you as a military guy, uh, teamwork is incredibly important. And the reason our success rate is so high is because people get together and cover each other's backs. And if you can't make a meeting, somebody steps in and, um, and capture, you know, captures the gist of that meeting, feeds it back to you. We have students who travel on business. Uh, and they sometimes they travel overseas. I have a student in the section I teach at six o'clock he was in Tokyo two weeks ago um, uh, on a business trip I had another student down in Argentina uh, last year so we you can do this because we have a team and your team is is really uh, how you get through this course 
Air Force. Yes, I thought so. I saw your wings. <clears throat> Very smart looking uh, uniform too, I might add, Jamie. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Professor, I think we won't take more of your time. Uh, you I, just, know. I have one more thing to tell you. Yes. Uh, so we are working on getting a uh, lady by the name of Jackie Wright, who is the chief technology officer for McKinsey, to speak to you, the MBA club, um, likely to be sometime next semester. She is an alum of Baruch College. And I spoke with her, um, one of her assistants, two weeks ago. And Kadisha is working on, uh, I think, collecting some topics and areas of interest that you all have. And then she's going to set up a date. We have also invited um, Jackie to be a um, Mitsui Lunchtime Forum speaker. So we may get her to do both on the same day. Um, but you'll have an opportunity to talk to a very, very senior executive at a very, very well-known global consulting company. Uh, we are also planning some seminars on AI, um, generative uh, AI, and I'm working with a, a senior partner at Ernst & Young on these. And once they're firmed up, we'll expect to get the word out. Uh, we, I think that would be an area that you guys would be interested in. And also, if any of you would like to have a conversation one-on-one -on -one <clears throat> about anything really i mean your career what it's like to go into consulting or not and so on and so forth uh, just let me know i'm i'm a you know baruch male uh i'm easily accessible and i'm happy to do it and i also uh, talk to students on weekends if it's convenient for them thank you very much professor that's very generous of you and mba club Thank you for the support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Uh, it's a pleasure. And I've enjoyed doing this very much. And I thank all of you. And um, and I wish you all the best in your future, which I know is bright. Have a good thank evening, you. everybody. And happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Bye.